blessed tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you take the word of God, please, and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Got him. Boom. Dead. You ain't, you ain't flying in my mouth, amen? Mm-mm. Not going to happen. So sorry. I should have tried to time it when I said something. Amen! But I probably would have scared him away, so we'll just do it that way, all right? Amen. Note to self, don't shake my hand after service till I wash my hand. I'm actually probably going to think about it the rest of the message now. Disgusting. Hey. There we go. Good. All right, Philippians chapter 2. Now, we love going through the Bible and taking it word upon word, line upon line, theme upon theme. Um, but I want to tell you that the reason that we started in this series was because of something Brother Arp had said years ago on helping young kids learn how to remember the organization of where these books lie. And he said, just remember, go eat popcorn. I'm like, what? Go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I'm like, wow, that's really neat. And so we started our Go Eat Popcorn series. So we are right now at the popped area on chapter two. I've given you enough time. You should be there out of Philippians chapter number two. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11 this evening, but I am going to go back to verse number 1 of Philippians chapter 2 just to kind of bring it all together because we'll be going back a little bit, referencing some of that at the very beginning of this message. It says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded." Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I want you to notice, by the way, notice it doesn't, it doesn't just say you can't look on the things of yourself. It just says every man also on the things of others. In other words, Yes, take care of your own stuff and things like that, but be mindful of other people as well. That it's not always just about you. This verse isn't saying, don't ever think about yourself. It's saying, don't put yourself in a place to where other people around you don't matter. Their feelings don't matter. Their situation doesn't matter. Uh, all those types of things. I don't have time to get into all that, but I just want to bring that public service announcement to you, all right? Verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who... Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a lot going on in just three little verses. Now, we spent the last several weeks looking at a submitted mind, and we're beginning with the perfect example, Jesus Christ. Oh, the one who lived his life ultimately and uh, fulfillingly to glorify the Father. He is the perfect example, the pur perfect display, the perfect execution of what a submitted mind is. How we saw in the last couple weeks how he thought, how he served, and how he sacrificed. And now we want to see how he glorified God and how he glorifies God. Now we spent this last Sunday opening with the Lord's high priestly prayer. And in the opening phrase of that prayer, we read that the Lord exclaimed that these words spake Jesus and lifted up his, his eyes to heaven and said, Lord, I said, Father, I'm sorry, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Now, I'm not here to rehash Sunday morning's message, but you get a very clear picture in the life of Jesus and the attitude of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus that he was here to glorify the Father which is in heaven. 
And notice that that is the statement he makes in that high priestly prayer first and foremost. I want to get out of the way exactly what I'm here to do. Glorify me that, thou, that the Father might be glorified. Now, I want us to understand, the reason we went back to John 17 is to understand and have full comprehension that Jesus' full intention was to reveal God and to give him honor. That's his full intention. He has come here. He said, if you know me, you have known the Father. Uh, and all the things that he had done was to reveal God and give him honor. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 20, a wise son maketh a glad father. Now it's interesting because you read that verse and then it talks about uh, basically a wicked son and the, the stress or the problem or the dishonor that he brings to his mother, which is very interesting. And three times you'll read that same exact phrase in the opening. You'll read three times, a wise son maketh a glad father. Three times. Now, the interesting thing is all three times it's changed at the end, but it's always against the mother. But the whole theme is, the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus in his life was there to bring honor and glory to his father. There was never a moment in Jesus's life that he ever disappointed his father, ever. He had a submitted mind. He was there to do one thing. Jesus had a single mind that was submissive. His single goal was to glorify the God, Father by redeeming fallen men. Well, how does he do that? By being the propitiation. What is that? The appeasing of God's wrath with his sacrifice. The only sacrifice that God was acceptable to God. So he glorified the Father by redeeming fallen men, by being the propitiation. How would he do that? By giving his life at Calvary as the perfect sacrifice. Well, how would he do that? By living a perfect, sinless life. Well, how would he do that? By being the son of God. Well, how would he do that? By being born of a virgin. Well, how would he do that? By coming to earth. All of those things brought glory to God. His resurrection brought glory to God. Everything he did was to bring glory to God. There was no confusion about what he was here to do. Not at all. Jesus, who is God, never strayed from the intended plan for his life. He submitted his body to punishment and pain of this life. He submitted his body to the punishment and pain of guilt. Yet, he wasn't guilty. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 18. I promise you I have a point to all of this, okay? You're like, we're not really talking about what you said. We are getting there, I promise you. We're laying the groundwork. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, starting in verse number 18, it says, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit, or as a result of, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespass unto them, and hath committed unto us the... I'm sorry. Yeah, committed us unto the word of reconciliation. Sorry. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So think about all of these things. There is a back and forth in all of this. God has reconciled us. Jesus Christ was the sacrifice that for, any, for all of fallen man and those who would trust Christ and receive Christ their Savior would now be reconciled back to God. And because of that, because we've been reconciled back now, he says, hey, I've done this for you. Now you go out and you have a ministry of reconciliation. Now notice, there's no parameters on who has that ministry. Hello. Some people say, Does every, is everybody called to give the gospel? Is everybody called to tell people about Jesus? Yes, Amen. everybody. Now, we may do it in different ways. 
Not everybody's going to be a pastor. Not everybody's going to be a missionary. Not everybody is going to uh, do certain ways, but we are all called to give the gospel and reach out to people. Now, you cannot even say that I'm going to have children and those are the people I'm going to reach. So are you going to choose to not reach anybody while you have no children? What happens if you don't? God doesn't give you children. Then who are you going to invest in? No, no, no. I think we ought to be submitted to the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That means we are to give out the gospel to anybody the Holy Spirit leads us to talk to. Now, here's the thing. I know it's happened to you. And you know, there have been times it's happened to me. And there are times that I have given the gospel and man, God blessed it. And there are other times that I have told God straight up, no. I may not have said verbally no, but I got in my car as fast as I could and I got out of there. Hello, am I the only one? You know? So we are to give the gospel because he's given us this ministry, ministry of reconciliation. So then if we have these uh, we have this because our, our guilt is not put upon us or imputed in us because we're in Christ. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second, but he bore our sins in his own body. So he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So because we have been purchased and paid for, we, we got off, in essence, scot-free. We, because we've been given that, again, he reiterates, you've been given the ministry of reconciliation. So just in case you missed it the first time, I want to make sure you get it the second time. He says, now then we are what? Ambassadors. So even if you're not convinced that we are to give the gospel because he says we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, but now he says you're ambassador. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative of somebody who is not there presently. Jesus is not physically here present. So every single believer is now the representative of Jesus Christ. With what message? The message of reconciliation. So he's given it to us. Now, this is where I tried, I'm trying to get to. I'm really trying to get there. This is just good stuff. Anyway, be reconciled to God for he hath made, I'm sorry, I gotta go back a little bit. Sorry, one more. For we are ambassador of Christ as though God did beseech you by us. Now think about that. All right. So when I'm giving, say I give the message of the gospel to Aiden and I'm telling Aiden and I'm telling him the Bible truth. I'm not telling him my church. I'm not telling him my personal opinion. I'm giving him the gospel. And he's saying here, in essence, when I'm giving you the gospel, it's as if God is beseeching you or begging you. Why? Because I'm, if I'm not giving him tradition, if I'm not giving him religion, if I'm giving him the Bible, I'm giving him the word of God. That's right. So it's as if God is begging or beseeching you. Isn't that interesting? Amen. He says, when you're giving the word of God, think of this, that you are literally giving the words of God and it's as if God is drawing because who is the only one that can draw? God. We're just being faithful, giving out the word. See, it's so important that we give out the gospel. So, though he was not guilty, it says he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So, that means that he died as me. He took on my punishment, all of my sins, all of my, my failings, everything I've ever done and will do. Yes, Jesus? Uh, he paid for. He paid for it. He took it on his body. The wrath of God was poured out for you and for me. He submitted his body to the punishment and pain of Calvary. He submitted his body to the punishment and pain of death. Amen. It's an important message. Yet he submitted his mind first to allow the physical to follow through. Today our minds must be fixed to do the will of God. Not for you, but for the glory of God. The submissive mind to glorify God will allow us to trust God in faith, to live for God in peace, to pray to God in confidence, to sing to God in harmony, to believe God in righteousness. Fixed mind, submitted mind. So let's look at how he glorifies God. Number one, through purity. Through purity. Remember what Paul said earlier? He said, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Everything Jesus did was in purity. 
He was there to glorify the Father. He loved every person with an everlasting love. He said that, right? He said, I love them unto the end. I love them unto the full. I love them unto the max. It was a purity. He glorified God in his purity that everything he did had no side motive. There was nothing about Jesus. There was nothing about there was nothing about anything but glorifying the Father. It was all impurity. In that earthly body, he was directing people and trying to get them to see God and glorify God. What does vainglory do? Vainglory pits member against member, church against church. And Jesus was there to give the gospel message. I, I don't think it's seen any more clear than this. Remember when the disciples came and said, hey, there's people out there and they're casting demons out in your name, but they're not of us. And Jesus basically said, but they're not against us. In other words, I, I'm not ecumenical, so just go. And so if that's what you want to do, that's not my thing, so don't do it to me, okay? Don't complain about other churches. Because what if, that's, what if they're the only church that can reach my kids if they go wayward or my grandkids in the future? I may not do it the way they do it. I may not like the way they do certain things, but if they're preaching the gospel, then it's not my job to preach against them. I'm going to preach against sin. I'm going to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's why Paul said, I, I, I basically said, I've committed to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. This is not me saying everybody's good and I approve of all what they're doing. No, matter of fact, I don't even know what half of them are doing. You know why? I don't care. We got enough going on here. And I've got enough to study in my Bible. I don't have time to worry about what other churches are doing. I don't go to a whole bunch of fellowship meetings. I don't have a problem with fellowship meetings. I just don't have time. Why? Because you guys are a little more important than hanging out at a meeting, you know? Things happen. Things go on. That's what the important thing is. It was the glory of God that gave Jesus his purpose. Now, I want you to think about this. Jesus never at all, in, in the whole, in all whole time he lived on this earth, Never wondered, is what I'm doing worth it? Now, let's rewind. Have you ever thought to yourself, if, is what I'm doing worth it? Our Savior never wondered if what he was doing was worth it. Why? Because he always knew with a submitted mind he was there for a specific purpose and you and you and you and you are worth it. Because the answer is always yes. Jesus Christ in you, he can make a difference. So be faithful. Do what God's asked you to do. You know, I think sometimes the devil works so hard to get people pressed down because God has such a great plan for them and he wants them to choose him. When Peter was writing his epistle, he was writing to people, trying to encourage them during their time of trial and tribulation that it's worth it to live for Jesus. Hey, some of you might give your life. It's worth it. Hey, some of you are going to lose some of your family. It's worth it. Hey, some of you are going to lose your home. It's worth it. Think about what Peter was writing. Remember, he says, and if for a time, if need be, you're going to suffer some things. Could you imagine that? Can you imagine walking in my office and you say, Pastor, I'm just going through so many trials. And I say, maybe that's what God has for you. Maybe it's time to buckle up and just get after it. You'd be like, wow, I'm not coming to you for encouragement anymore. <laughs> but that's the truth of it. Everybody wants the trials gone. We only want blessings. When's the last time you ever heard anybody say, oh, I'm so mad at God. All he does is bless me and bless me and bless me and bless me. Oh, so annoying. No, you don't ever. But God could bless you for 60 years of life and at 61, he gives you terminal disease and you have three months to live and you're like, oh, I tell you what, I was so mad at God. What? You have had 60 years of nothing but blessing and blessing and blessing and you get one bit of bad news and now God's your enemy? That's what Paul said in Galatians. He goes, am I your enemy now because I tell you the truth? But Peter was writing this message you know who else thought it was worth it? Go with me to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, there are three guys that didn't question if it was worth serving God. You can thank little Mr. Danny Bowers for this thought. 
because I was studying and I added this in last minute because Danny and I had this conversation the other day and it just fits perfect there. That's why I love talking the Bible with people because you start to think things and God puts things in there. Mm, amen. That's good stuff. If you want to talk to me about stuff? Let's talk about the Bible. Amen. Let's talk about the Bible. Let's pray together. Here we go. Daniel chapter six. Starting in verse number 16, we look about at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in verse 16 of Daniel chapter 6 answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Oh, I love this. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, underlined those nexus. But if not, uh, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They had a submitted mind that God was the only God to serve, and they were going to give it all. And if it meant their life, they didn't care. They weren't going to turn their back on God. And God did deliver them. He delivered them from death. He delivered them from fire damage. He even delivered them from the heat. Think about this. Again, I was like three days old when I learned this, okay? And uh, I've preached this message. I've talked about this message. What happened to the gentleman that took them to the fire furnace? What happened to them? They died. They got overcome by the heat. They didn't make it in the furnace because they weren't going there anyway. They died from the heat on the outside. Now, Danny and I were burning some brush out here in the yard, and this is what made us talk about this. And I'm telling you what, we're like, we're like, uh, uh, like my skin is on fire. It's terrible. Just trying to get one stick in there. You ever had that before? You're like covering up. It's like, I want so bad to eat this s'more, but my hand is melting, you know? I don't know why they don't make like shield guards for those things or whatever the case is, or like 50 foot poles, you know? But you suffer for that stupid marshmallow only to watch it drop on the ground. But anyway, and we're sitting there on fire and I'm like, man. And Danny's like, hey, can you imagine Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They just walk right into that fire. So you think about that. The clothes didn't burn. Their hair didn't burn. They didn't smell like smoke. And they weren't overcome by the heat. Now, that's pretty miraculous. But I really believe it's because they determined in their mind that God was going to protect them no matter what. And they had a submitted mind. And it was the purest of mind saying, we just want to live for God. We want to love God. These are the three fears that every believer worries about. Death, damage, and discouragement. And God delivered them from death. He delivered them from fire damage. And he delivered them from discouragement or the heat. Listen, the heat of life sometimes. That's why people don't want to go out and witness sometimes. Because they don't want to take the heat of somebody that might disagree with them. Let me just tell you something. This is going to sound terribly rude, and I don't mean it to be, but this is the way it came to my mind, so I'm going to say it. People aren't as smart as you think they are. They have swallowed down some YouTube videos, and they have watched them, and they have memorized some rhetoric. But can I just tell you, you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you. And there ain't no YouTube video that's going to beat the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know how many times I witness to people, and I start saying stuff, and I'm, in a, I'm amazed. I'm like, where's this coming from? The Holy Spirit. And you start giving them some just truth. And you start asking them some questions. Ask them questions about their own logic. And let me tell you, people aren't as smart as they think they are. Amen. And the Holy Spirit will make them do the old Fred Flintstone. <laughs> stopping. But they serve with purity. And what did that end up happening for them? Well, in Daniel chapter 6, verses 29 and 30, look what it says there. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, language, which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into, in pieces, and their house shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God than, that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is why the Bible says that it's not just God that does it. Now listen to me on this one. Philippians chapter 4 says, but my God. You know the reason that they were delivered? Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he was their God. My God will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. Can you say something with me real quick? Ready? Say it with me. You ready? My God will supply. You ready? Here we go. 
My God will supply. Oh, we got to do better than that. Internet people are listening. We want them to know there's more than 10 people here. Amen. Here we go. My God will supply. He will. He will supply. He will do exceedingly abundantly more than you ask or think. I'm just telling you, get your life and will with God and watch him bless. They did not do what they did for promotion. They did it for their God. And Jesus did not do what he did to impress people. Matter of fact, most of the things he did made people mad. But his father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's interesting. Some of the things that men will do to impress a woman. And I'm saying this to some fellows that have probably done some things. Now listen, Sarah, you're getting married, so I'm going to ask you. Would it impress you if Luvio said, hey, Sarah, watch this and he rammed his head into the wall and broke the drywall. Would that impress you? Guys do it all the time. They do the dumbest thing around girls. Like, check me out. I'm going to break my arm in front of my girlfriend. I'm going to laugh about it. Why? It, that's vainglory. They're trying to do something to prove their testosterone, that they're tougher than somebody else. And guys do the dumbest stuff. And they think that girls are like, <laughs> Did you see how his tibia snapped? It was so cute. <laughs> no! Nobody says that. Jesus did not live his life to impress anybody but God the Father. That's it. So he did it through purity. He did it through power. Christ's exaltation began at his resurrection. And this is something that no other person could have done. People have healed in the name of Jesus. People have done things, but nobody has ever brought themselves back to life. And this brings glory to God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Can I tell you something? Mankind put their hands on our Savior, and Jesus allowed it. Mankind spit in the face of Jesus, and he allowed it. Mankind nailed Jesus to the cross, and he allowed it. Mankind stripped our Savior, and he allowed it. And the last thing that mankind ever did to Jesus in that fashion was they put his body into a tomb. He rose up from the grave, alive forevermore. They did their best to seal it. They did their best to try to stop him. Matthew 27, 65, Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, go your, make it, go your way, make it as sure as you can. They failed. <laughs> so he did it through power. The things that Jesus did, all through a submissive mind, that the wonderful power of Jesus. But then we see, it says here in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 10, and that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things of earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We see that he had a submissive mind. He brought glory to God through his power, through his purity, but also through his pronouncement, his name. Men gave Jesus names of ridicule, and they mocked him. But God gave him a name above every name. When you and I pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. Now, we're not doing that as a tagline, but upon the authority of of Jesus Christ, that we have been purchased with his blood. We are praying in the name of Jesus. The model prayer, it says, God the Father, hallowed be thy name. We know that Jesus is the second person in the Trinity, and he too would deserve the hallowedness of his name. It's interesting, back in the Old Testament, and the scribes at points would get to certain names of God and would stop, and they would take a bath and they would change their clothes and they would change the pen and they would write that name and then they would stop and they would do it all over again because that name was so holy and so reverent that they took the time before they wrote it and after they wrote it to make sure they were clean and ceremonial clean and they didn't just flippantly say it like I, I really do I, I, I it's funny I'm a funny guy but I get irritated sometimes by funny guys I don't like to mock about prayer. I don't like to mock about Jesus' name or anything like that. I don't think those jokes are funny. I don't think they're funny at all. Because 
We have diminished the name of Jesus, but God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. So the name of Jesus, the name of our Savior should be valued and, and powerful. Amen. We're seeing a decline in this world because we've taken away every bit of structure to protect the name of Jesus. All in the sense of bringing a crowd. Listen, Jesus never wanted a crowd. He wanted disciples. He, he had a crowd. People followed him. But he was seeking to make disciples. His pronouncement of this powerful and wonderful name. God gave him a name that every man would bow down to and every tongue would confess. He gives him authority on earth. In Acts chapter 2, verse 32 to 36, it says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all, we all are witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. People have gone on, and even demons recognize him. I know Jesus, but who are you? See, on earth, the name of Jesus is powerful. The name of Jesus in this earth today is powerful. The name of Jesus in the world today is probably the most beloved name in the world. But it's also the most hated name in the world. You can talk about God and you can talk about certain things, but you start naming the name of Jesus Christ, you'll start to see people get angry. I don't know what it is. You start talking about church, people are cool. You start talking about God in general, people are cool. But you start naming specifically the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll begin to see people squirm and get angry. Why is that? Because there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. And those people that are opposed to it fear and hate the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because God hath highly exalted him and given a name above every name. So authority on earth, authority in heaven, all to the glory of God the Father. It's in the name above every name. This name will come from heaven one day. Go with me to Revelation chapter 19. I love this. Revelation chapter number 19. Looking at verses 11 through 16. One day we're looking for this mighty and wonderful and powerful name to come again. In Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse number 11, it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed, clothed with the vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he shall tread the winepresses of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath in his vesture and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords there is power in his name three times we saw about this name that nobody knows and that his name is the word of god and his name is the king of kings and lord of lords one day that powerful name is coming back from heaven do you know him tonight are you serving him tonight Listen, confession of that name in this life is called salvation. Confession in the life to come is condemnation. Make sure you don't get those ones backwards, amen. Make sure you call upon the Lord today. Serve him today. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be served. Live your life with no regrets. It's a wonderful, powerful name in heaven right now. But the day is getting closer where he will return. The name of Jesus I don't fear that name because he's my savior. He's my king. He's my friend. Some names, depending on your relationship, make a difference. 
Right now, if I were to say, police, some people might be like, why? Well, they've done something wrong, and they don't want to see the police. But I don't care. The police is my friend. They're there to help me. Mom's home. <laughs> Maybe some chores aren't done. But if all your chores are done and you're right with mom, then you're like, oh, mom's home. Kids, your father's home. <laughs> Depending on what happened throughout the day could depend how you react to that name. The name hospital. Oh, it could bring joy. A new baby is born. They're helping out. But when you've been given a terminal disease, it's not a place you want to be. Prison! I don't fear prison. I've done nothing to merit that. Unless preaching the word of God gets me there, which it may one day. But I don't fear prison. But when somebody is standing there and the judge says, guilty, life in prison, there's fear. Jesus, to me, is the sweetest name I know. Jesus, what a wonderful name. How long, I'll finish with this, how long do you think we should praise our Savior? I'm glad you asked that question, Danny. I'm going to answer that for you, okay? Psalm 113, and verse number three. Go there with me, all right? We're going to answer Danny's question real quick, all right? He's given authority on earth, given authority in heaven. How long should we praise him? Psalm 113 and verse number three says, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. All the time. If you're awake, praise the Lord. I want to show you one last thing. He has authority on earth. He has authority in heaven. But it says he's been given an, a, a, a name above all names uh, that when you should bow and things of heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. That would lead me to believe the lost people because the Bible tells us that God's people, saved people according to chapter, Ephesians chapter 3, are either in heaven or they're on earth. But there are people that will reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that he has conquered hell and death. But there was a time where in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 that the authority or power over death was taken fully and forevermore. 118 of Revelation says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Aren't you glad in heaven there'll be no more death, no more crying, no more suffering? Bowing the knee on earth is salvation, but bowing the knee after death is condemnation. And Jesus came to this life and he served with a submitted mind to glorify God with a, through his purity and through his power and through his proclamation or promotion, if you will. The wonderful name of Jesus. And Jesus is the best example we could have if you live your life fully and wholeheartedly for Jesus Christ, then you will not live life that says, and what I'm doing, does it really matter? Because the Spirit of God inside will say, yes, yes, a thousand times, yes. Have a submitted mind. Have it in how you think, how you serve, and how you sacrifice, because it will be displayed in how you glorify God. Let's pray together, shall we? Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. Thank you for giving us the example and the pattern to follow in Jesus Christ. 